The sutta today is sutta number 46, The Greater Discourse on Ways of Undertaking Things. Sounds kind of exotic, doesn't it? Thus, if I heard on one occasion a blessed one was living at Sawati in Jetta's Grove, Anathan Pendika's Park. There he addressed the monks thus, monks, venerable sir, they replied, the blessed one said this. Monks, for the most part, beings have this wish, desire, and longing. If only unwished for, undesired, disagreeable things would diminish, and wished for desired agreeable things would increase. Yet, although beings have this wish, desire, and longing, unwished for, undesired, disagreeable things increase for them, and the wished for desired agreeable things diminish. Now, what do you think is the reason for that? I'm still catching my breath. Excuse me just a moment. Venerable sir, our teachings are rooted in the blessed one, guided by the blessed one, have the blessed one as their resort. It would be good if the Blessed One would explain the meaning of these words. Having heard it from the Blessed One, the monks will remember it. Then listen, monks, and attend closely to what I shall say. Be attentive. Don't let your mind wander. Yes, venerable sir, the blessed one said this. Here monks an odd, untaught ordinary person who has no regard for the noble ones and is unskilled and undisciplined in their dhamma, who has no regard for true men and is unskilled and undisciplined in their dhamma, does not know what things should be cultivated and what things should not be cultivated, does not know what things should be followed and what things should not be followed. Not knowing this, he cultivates things that should be cultivated, or should not be cultivated, excuse me, and does not cultivate things that should be cultivated. He follows things that should not be followed, and he does not follow things that should be followed. It is because he does not, excuse me, it is because he does this that unwanted, undesirable, disagreeable things increase for him and wished for desirable, agreeable things diminish. Why is that? That is what happens to one who does not see. A well-taught noble disciple who has regard for noble ones and is skilled and disciplined in their dhamma, who has regard for true men and is skilled and disciplined in their dhamma. The difference between these two statements, one is for the they're talking about the practicing monks, the monks that practice meditation. And the other, the, the true men, are the ones that are the scholars and the studiers of the Dhamma. So that's the difference between that. Knowing this, he cultivates things that should be cultivated and does not cultivate things which should not be cultivated. 
he follows things that should be followed and does not follow things that should not be followed. It is because he does this that unwished for undesired disagreeable things diminish in him and wished for desired agreeable things increase. Why is that? That is what happens when one knows and sees. It's really kind of an amazing phenomena that when you start keeping your precepts without breaking them, you'll, just, you'll have a thought of something. Oh, it would be nice if I could see this person or that this would happen. And it does. And that's directly because of keeping the precepts without breaking them. Makes life a lot more fun and enjoyable. Monks, there are four ways of undertaking things. What are the four? There is a way of undertaking things that is painful now and ripens in the future as pain. That is some kinds of meditation. I know because I've done that. There is a way of undertaking things that is pleasant now and ripens in the future as pain. There is a way of undertaking things that is painful now and ripens in the future as pleasure. <coughs> there is a way of undertaking things that is pleasant now and ripens in the future as pleasant. That's what we're after. That's the whole point of doing meditation so that your mind can be more uplifted. And you practice your generosity by helping other people that are suffering to lessen their load. And the best way to do that is with a smile on your face while you're being helpful. And while you're not being helpful, have a smile on your face all the time. Now, one who is ignorant, not knowing this way of undertaking things, that is painful now and ripens in the future as pain, does not understand as it actually is thus. This way of undertaking things is painful now and ripens in the future as pain, not knowing it not understanding it as it actually is. The ignorant one cultivates it and does not avoid it. Because he does so, unwished for, undesired, disagreeable things increase for him and wished for, desired, agreeable things diminish. Why is that? That is what happens to one who knows, uh, who does not know and see. Now, one who is ignorant, not knowing this way of undertaking things that is pleasant now and ripens in the future is pain. He does not understand as it actually is. This way of undertaking things is pleasant now. Um, this happens for somebody that steals something. It's very pleasant while they're doing it, but it ripens in pain in the future. Not knowing, not, not understanding as it actually is. The ignorant one cultivates it and does not avoid it because he does so. Unwished for things 
increase for him and wished for things diminish. Why is that? That is what happens to one who does not know and see things correctly. Now, one who is ignorant, not knowing this way of undertaking things that is painful now and ripens in the future as pleasure, does not understand it as it actually is thus. This way of undertaking things is painful now and ripens in the future as pleasure. Not knowing it, not understanding it as it actually is, the ignorant one does not cultivate it, but avoids it. Because he does so unwished for things, increase for him and wished for things diminish. Why is that? That is what happens to one who does not know and see. Now, one who is ignorant, not knowing and seeing the way of undertaking things that is pleasant now and ripens in the future is pleasant, does not understand it as it actually is thus. This way of undertaking things is pleasant now, ripens in the future is pleasant, not knowing, not understanding, Things as they actually are, the ignorant one does not cultivate it, but avoids it because he does so. Unwished for things increase for him and it, wished for things diminish. Why is that? That is what happens to one who knows and sees. Now, one who is wise, knowing this way of undertaking things that is painful now and ripens in the future as pain, understands as it actually is thus. This way of undertaking things is painful now and ripens in the future as pain. Knowing it, understanding as it actually is, the wise one does not cultivate that, but avoids it because he does so unwished for things, uh, unwished for, undesired, disagreeable things diminish for him and wished for desired, agreeable things increase. Why is that? That is what happens to one who knows and sees. Now, one who is wise, knowing this way of undertaking things that is pleasant now and ripens in the future as pain understands as it actually is thus. This way of undertaking things is pleasant now and ripens in the future as pain. Knowing, understanding as it actually is, the wise one does not cultivate that, but avoids it because he does not does so. Because he does so, unwished for things will diminish for him and wished for things will increase. Why is that? That is what happens to one who knows and sees. So what the Buddha is actually doing is trying to drum it into your head that if you really truly understand things, life is going to be easy, fun, educational. You're gonna understand things as they actually are. But when you don't follow this path, life becomes troublesome. Now, one who is wise, knowing and seeing the way of undertaking things that is painful now and ripens in the future as pleasure, 
understands as it actually is thus. This way of undertaking things is painful now and ripens in the future as pleasure, knowing it, understanding it, as it actually is, the wise one does not, uh, does not avoid it, but cultivates it. Because he does so and wished for things diminish and wished for things increase. Why is that? That's what happens to one who knows and sees. One of the things I've always found interesting about Buddhism is kind of the insistence on understanding. If you don't understand what you're doing, life is difficult. Things are hard to do. And when you do understand how these things work, then you avoid the pitfalls. You avoid the, the problems of life. And that's one of the things that when I'm giving a retreat, I'm basically asking, how do you understand what's happening with you? And then I try to help you to get that understanding so that it's straight, so that you do understand. Now, one who is wise, knowing and seeing the way of undertaking things that is pleasant now and ripens in the future as pleasure, understands as it actually is thus. This way of undertaking things is pleasant now and ripens in the future as pleasure. Knowing it, understanding as it actually is, the wise one does not of avoid it, but cultivates it. Because he does so, unwished for things diminish and wished for things increase. Why is that? That's what happens to one who knows and sees as it actually is. What is the way of undertaking things that is painful now and ripens in the future as pain? Here, someone in pain and grief kills living beings. And he experiences pain and grief that have having have that have killing the of living beings as condition. In pain and grief, he takes what is not given or misconducts himself in sensual pleasures or speaks falsehoods, or speaks maliciously, or speaks harshly, or gossips, or is covetous. They have a mind of ill will, hold wrong views, and experiences pain and grief that have wrong view as condition. On the dissolution of the body after death, he, reappear, he reappears in a state of depravity, an unhappy destination, even in hell. This is called the way of undertaking things that is painful now and ripens in, in the future as pain. So what did we just say? When you break the five precepts, it causes pain now and it's gonna cause pain in the future. How does it cause pain now? Because your intuition tells you, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have said that. That was a wrong thing to do. But you kind of slough it off and say, well, even though it's painful now, so what? And you 
cloud the way you see the world. You have a lot more fear, anxiety, depression when you break the precepts. Even a minor thing that's uh, something that's becoming popular, at least what I've seen in this country, is the use of foul language. And you think, ah, oh, that's nothing. But it is something. Anybody that uses foul language, what kind of mental state are they cultivating? Aversion, dislike, dissatisfaction. And that stays with them until they realize and understand, till they educate themselves. This is one of the reasons that I keep telling everybody that you are your own teacher. It's really important for you to understand from your direct experience how you cause your own pain. You can't blame somebody else for your pain. You hear all the politicians, they, they, they have to blame somebody else for their bad actions. No, it doesn't work that way. It causes a lot of confusion and a lot more dis, dissatisfaction. So the more seriously you take to keeping the precepts, the more uplifting mind you have. What is the way of undertaking things that is pleasant now and ripens in the future as pain? Here, someone in pleasure and joy kills living beings. And he experiences pleasure and joy, that of killing or harming living beings. With that as condition, I know some people, and I actually have a brother that takes a lot of joy in fishing. And I can't be around him when he's fishing. The kind of joy he experiences is definitely unpleasant for me. And to see the fish suffer and drowned of oxygen is not a pleasant thing. Oh, but look at how much joy I'm going to have from eating it. No, I'm not going to eat it. One, because I'm a monk and it's against the rules for me to eat something that's killed for me. But I have a personal revulsion of that. And I don't like being around that kind of energy. Or he, he takes pleasure and joy from taking what is not given, from stealing. Oh, I know a lot of people that get real happy when they steal something because they have it. Oh, boy. One of the interesting things about taking what is not given is that it doesn't last very long. If it's money, it just seems to disappear. And that causes pain in the future. It's kind of a strange phenomenon. Uh, I had a friend many, many years ago that he had just gotten out of jail. And he went into some place that had a, a safe and he broke the safe open. And he said, oh, I was so excited as soon as that door opened and I saw all that money. And I asked him, what did you use the money for? 
oh, just this and that, it just disappeared. How long did it last? Well, I, it lasted more than a month. Well, then you got to go out and steal and do that again? What is this? <laughs> So it really causes, again, all kinds of fear and anxiety, fear of being caught. And holding to wrong views, taking everything personally taking pride in what you're doing when you're doing the wrong things. Even the pride that you get when you're doing meditation and it does not lead to more peace and happiness. That, uh, that's really a problem. I've had some students that they were mentally unbalanced and they couldn't even close their eyes to sit in meditation. So one of the things I found out when I first became a monk was there's a definite reason that we do different kinds of chants. And one of those chants is chanting the good qualities of the Buddha. Now, this means reciting. When you start reciting the good qualities of the Buddha, fear disappears. Fear goes away. So what I had them do was every morning and evening before they tried to sit in meditation for a little while, I would have them recite this. And it took about a week. And then they started feeling more at ease and, and more comfortable with the, uh, the meditation. And uh, a little while later, it wasn't even another week, it was just a few days later. Then they were able to sit and they could close their eyes for 15 minutes and wish themselves happiness and forgive themselves for causing themselves pain. So it worked pretty well. And I highly recommend it. And if you want to know where you can get that, uh, go to Sutta number 27 in the Majjhima Nikaya. And it has the good qualities of the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha there. Okay. So they can recite any one that they want. They all work equally well. Okay, he experiences pleasure and joy that have wrong view as condition. On the dissolution of the body after death, he reappears in a state of deprivation and an unhappy destination, even in hell. This is called the way of undertaking things that's pleasant now and ripens in the future as pain. Now, this is also very prevalent with wrong sexual activity. Sexual activity with another person's mate is wrong sexual activity. Sexual activity with somebody that's still under the care of their parents, somebody that's too young. 
So it's a real interesting thing that that's what you hear a lot about on, um, on the television. It's the pain you cause anyone else around if you have sexual activity that is not wholesome. It doesn't mean that you don't have, you can't have sexual activity, that's up to you. But activity in the right way that doesn't cause anybody pain, including yourself or that other person. So, What is a way of undertaking things that's painful now and ripens in the future as pleasure? Here someone is in pain or in grief, abstains from killing living beings. He experiences pain and grief that have abstention from killing living beings as condition. In pain and grief, he abstains from taking what is not given, from misconduct and sensual pleasures, from spe speaking falsehood, from speaking maliciously, from speaking harshly, from gossiping. He is not covetous. He does not have a mind of ill will. He holds right view and experiences pain and grief that have right view as condition. When somebody in your family dies, you have pain and grief. But it's not unwholesome. Now, I worked with a lot of people at one time. I worked with a lot of people that one of their relatives died. And they tried to push the pain away and ignore the pain that was there. And if you do that, within two years, you are going to have some kind of major physical problem. Because you're trying to suppress the feeling of grief and sadness that you have. You're gonna act like it's nothing. It is something. And you have to allow that to come out by itself, quite often by tears. Uh, there was one man that <clears throat> he, he was British and his daughter died. And he did not grieve. And he kept telling me that he has a stiff upper lip. And I, after about a year and a half, I noticed that he had cancer growing on his lip. So I told him that he has to forgive himself for having that attitude. And not hold a stiff upper lip. Eventually, he had it taken care of. He, he did have to have it taken off, made his face look funny. But that was a major lesson for him. I've told this story a few times. I had a student that she was doing quite well in her meditation. And she took her kids, a son and daughter, out to the ocean. And a shark came and got the daughter. And a couple days after that, they found the shark and opened it up and found the remains of the daughter. And the lady had to go and identify the body. Now, she'd been pretty good at letting go of the grief and pain, but she was getting overwhelmed by it. 
and she asked, what, she, what, what can I do so I'm not overwhelmed? I said, be overwhelmed. This is an overwhelming situation. It's a highly painful situation. Don't suppress the feelings. The truth is those feelings are there. And it's okay for those feelings to be there because they're there. That is the truth. Don't fight with the truth. Allow the truth to be. Oh, but it embarrasses me when I, die, when, I, when I cry in front of other people. I said, no, no it, don't, don't do that. Don't be embarrassed by something like that. There's good reason for you to be letting go of this pain. And we got through that after a few weeks and she seemed to be steadying out. So I let her go on her way for a little while. And she called me up one day and she said, oh, I have this terrible feeling of missing my daughter. What am I supposed to do with that? I said, yeah, the same. One of the things that you can do is take, a, have a picture of her in front of you and talk to her and tell her that you miss her. Let the tears flow. Don't stop the tears. And she got through that. And then about six months later, it hit her again. And I told her that basically the same thing. And you can radiate loving kindness to her. It's a good idea to offer food to the Sangha and share all of that merit with her. That will make her mind happy. No matter where she is, she will receive that gift and it will make her mind uplifted, even if she's in a heavenly realm. So there are remedies for a lot of this. At another time, I told a person to go and buy an animal that's going to be killed. This was in, in Bali, and they, they eat a lot of pork there. So I told her to go buy a pig and let it go in the forest with the idea of letting go of this pain and suffering. And as soon as she did that, it, it's always amazing. When, when you let an animal go free, you're helping them overcome their fear of death. And they, they get blown away. They get really surprised when they see that you are not going to harm them. And they get very happy. And they'll trot off a little ways and then turn around and look you right in the eye. And it's like they're saying, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And that makes their mind very uplifted. And it helps you to let go of the pain and suffering. Giving life is a major thing. So anytime you can give life, it will help you to let go of your attachments. One lady came to me right after I became a monk. And she said, the doctor tells me I have six weeks to live. And I want to do something that will help me in the future. So I told her to go out and buy an animal that's going to be killed and let it go free. So what she did was she went down to the boat docks. She was right by the ocean there. 
or C, whatever it was. And she bought bait fish, bought a hundred fish every day and let it go free. And the fishermen thought that she was crazy. I saw her some years later, like five or six years later, and she was still alive. And she said she was uh, cancer free. I'm not saying that this is the way only, or this is the way to get rid of cancer, but for her, it worked. And I told her to make sure when I first gave her the instruction that she would let go of all of her pain and anxiety and fear when she let go of those fish. And she said a lot of them, they would go out a little ways, come back in and stare at her for a moment and then take off. So this happens with a lot of different kinds of animals. So what is the way of undertaking things that is pleasant now and ripens in the future as pleasant here is someone in pleasure and joy abstains from killing living beings and he experiences pleasure and joy that have abstention from killing or harming living beings as condition in pleasure and joy he abstains from taking what is not given. He holds to right views. What is holding to right views? The belief that precepts are helpful for you. Also, how dependent origination actually occurs. When you start seeing that more and more, uh, a, a lot of different religions, they like to use the word faith. And I really don't like that because it implies that there's something outside of you that you have to believe in. I like the word confidence because when you start seeing something work, and it works well, and it makes everybody around you happy along with yourself, then you want to continue doing that. And you have more and more confidence that this is the right thing to do. On the dissolution of the body, after death, he reappears in a happy destination, even in a heavenly world. This is called the way of undertaking things that is pleasant now and ripens in the future as pleasure. Suppose there were a bitter gourd mixed with poison. To my way of thinking, bitter gourd is poison, but a lot of people eat it, so it's not a real belief. And a man came who wanted to live, not to die, who wanted pleasure and recoiled from pain. And they told him, good man, this bitter gourd is mixed with poison. Drink from it. As, and as you drink it, its color, smell, and taste will not agree with you. I have to say that's really true. I spent a range retreat with a monk, the head monk liked bitter gourds, so they grew it there. And we tried 90 different ways of eating it and haven't found one yet. What can I say? Anyway, and after drinking from it, you will become, you will come to death or deadly suffering. Then he drank from it, 
without reflecting and did not relinquish it. As he drank from it, its color, smell, and taste did not agree with him. And after drinking from it, he came to death or deadly suffering. Similar to that, I say, is a way of undertaking things that is painful now and ripens in the future as pain. Suppose there were a bronze cup of beverage that possessed good color, good smell, and good taste, but it was mixed with poison. And a man who came who wanted to live, not to die, who wanted pleasure and recoil from pain. And they told him, good man, this bronze cup is a beverage possessed of good color, good smell, and good taste, but it is mixed with poison. Drink from it if you want. As you drink from it, its color, smell, and taste will agree with you, but after drinking from it, you will come to death or deadly suffering. Then he drank from it without reflecting and did not relinquish it. As he drank from it, its color, smell, and taste agreed with him. But after drinking from it, he came to death or deadly suffering. Similar to that, I say, is the way of undertaking things that is pleasant now and ripens in the future as pain. Suppose there were fermented urine mixed with various medicines and a man came with jaundice. Uh, one of the medicines that monks can use on themselves is a little bit revolting, but it's not as bad as it sounds. And that is taking cow's urine and you have to leave it in the sun for four days in a closed container. And if you have any kind of physical problem, it seems to help. Now, the, the only real problem with it is after you get it in your body, your body has a reaction to it and begins to smell very bad. Your body, you, you, you lose friends very quickly. You want to be outside most of the time, so it's not so overpowering. But after about a week of taking that, it's amazing that it does work. Fortunately, I've only had one kind of problem that needed to be solved like that. <clears throat> but it's amazing the different kind of medicines from different cultures you can most of the medicines in Asia are really foul tasting they're really not good at all but the American ingenuity came up with these capsules that you could put that stuff in and you don't have to taste it. So that, that's the only good thing that's come out of Western medicine as far as I can see. And that is kind of a joke, so I don't want you to take it seriously. And they told him, good man, this fermented urine is mixed with various medicines. Drink from it if you want. As you drink from it, its color, smell, and taste will not agree with you. But after drinking from it, you will be well. Then he drank from it after reflecting and did not relinquish it. As he drank from it, its color, taste, and smell did not agree with him. But after drinking it, he became healthy again. 
Similar to that, I say, is the way of undertaking things that is painful now and ripens in the future as pleasure. Suppose there were curd, honey, ghee, and molasses mixed together. Uh, that's one of the things, along with jaggery, that monks can take in the afternoon if their stomach is upset. Uh, it's quite quite nice. But there and there is oil in it. I forget what kind of oil. I think it might be peanut oil. I'm not sure. But it, it is an allowable thing for us to take for ourselves. But it can't be mixed over an open flame. It has to be done in the sun. It's one of the, the things of it. Okay. He did the curd, honey, ghee, molasses, mixed them together, and a man with dysentery, dysentery came. And they told him, good man, this curd, honey, mixed together drink from it if you want as you drink from it its color smell and taste will agree with you and after drinking from it you will be well then he from and did not de relinquish it as he drank from it its color Smell and taste agreed with him. After drinking from it, he became well. Similar to that, I say, is the way of undertaking things that is pleasant now and ripens in the future as pleasure. Just as in autumn, in the last month of the rains, when the sky is clear and, count and cloudless, the sun rises above the earth, dispelling the darkness from the space with its shining and beaming and radiance. So too, the way of undertaking things that is pleasant now and ripens in the future is pleasant, dispels it with its shining, beaming radiance of any other doctrines whatsoever of ordinary recluses and Brahmins. That's what the Blessed One said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Now, the whole thing, the whole point of this is getting you to realize how you cause your own pain and how to let go of that pain. Taking full responsibility of your pain and doing something about it. Quite often you can use your intuition. You can ask yourself, why is that pain here? Because you not, might not recognize it for being there you will get an answer and that will lead to your happiness and well-being. That's the whole point of meditation, of learning how to be happy and being the example for other people so that they are happy too. Too many times people think to be a teacher means to always be talking and trying to convince somebody of something else. And it's not that. It is being the example and showing how your mind can stay in equanimity and balance no matter what. As you go deeper into your meditation, 
you start understanding that more and more clearly. And that's one of the reasons that meditation turns into a fun activity. It doesn't have to be some kind of work, some kind of a problem. All life is part of meditation. If you carry the six R's with you, wherever you are, and you start to see your mind get knocked off balance, you can use the six R's to get back in balance. Now you might have to use the six R's more than one time, but that doesn't matter. What you don't want to get wrapped up in doing is releasing and relaxing and releasing and relaxing and releasing and relaxing. That doesn't work. You have to use the entire formula and you don't do them separately. You do them in order and you do all of the steps. When you get good at doing it, you'll be able to do it in less than a second, maybe even less than a half a second. It's recognize and release and relax and smile and come back, stay with it. That's the six R's. Letting go of your emotional attachments. that will lead to your happiness and the happiness of people around you. When you show them the equanimity, the balance that you have in your mind, you don't have to try to convince anybody that what they're doing isn't right. You don't have to even talk about what they're doing is right or wrong. It doesn't matter. As long as you lead a life that is uplifting and happy, you will affect the world around you in a positive way. And we really need that right now. The more positive we can be, the better off everybody else will be and the more things will start to settle down. So I've been talking for a while. Do you have any questions? Yes, thank you, but uh, you have to speak up a little bit. Okay, so I uh, make a point. Okay. But, uh, in relation to what you just said, uh, how would you wish people start at uh, local meditation groups? Uh, how to how to do it? Sorry. How to start a meditation group? Yeah. Gather people together, get them to listen to the instructions and in meditation from uh, our website, and then ask them to ask questions and see if you can answer. Now, if you run across something that you can't answer, get in touch with either David or me and we will help you with the answers okay okay thank you hi bante hello hi bante hi um i um i have a, a habit of uh cursing it's like the words come out before i even realize them it's kind of automatic. Is, is there any advice? Um, yeah, you kind of like it, is what the problem is. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so, every time you wind up using foul language, forgive yourself for doing that 
take the precepts again with emphasis on not using our language and make a strong determination that you're not going to do that again. You'll be surprised at how fast you can start letting that sort of thing go. Your mindfulness is not very good. And that is because you're breaking precepts. When you, when you keep your precepts, you begin to have sharper and sharper mindfulness with your daily activities. And you'll see things before they start to come up. And then you can decide whether you're going to use that or not. OK? OK, that's great. Thank you, Vante. OK. And also, if it's too difficult, what I want you to do is go out and buy an animal that's going to be killed and let it go free. In okay. Thailand, they buy little birds, like sparrows or whatever their small bird is, mm -hmm. and let it go free. OK. So you can use any kind of an animal. And the bigger the animal, the, the easier it is to let go. We had, um, that's, that's great, great advice. We had um, some turkey buzzards um, that, have been, that have been building a nest on the building here. Uh -huh. And we, uh, we helped to stop the, um, there were some uh, people coming along to, to take the, the, uh, the young ones away from the nest and remove them. We helped to stop that. And the turkey buzzard came and landed in front of us two days ago, like three or four feet away, not very far. And they never do that. And so like you were, said, they were thanking you. Yeah, yes. looked, looked us right yes. in the eye, looked us yes. right in the eye and basically said, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Turkey buzzards like uh, negative electromagnetic energy. Oh, oh okay. Okay. And if you want them to go away, but you don't want to harm them, you get some scrap metal, shredded scrap metal, and you put them in a, a container. You take a piece of crystal and put in that, and then get some boat resin and fill it up to the top. Okay. Let that dry and then put it close to the, the nest and it will make them feel unpleasant. It changes a negative energy into positive energy, doesn't harm them at all, right. but it, they, they will just go someplace else. Okay. Ah, we'll try that. That's great. It's called okay. Organite. Okay. And if you want to find out more about Organite, uh, you can do it on the website, on, on the different okay. websites that, on Organite. Okay, we should look for that. That's great. Okay. All right. Thank you, Bante. Thank you, Bante. You're welcome. Yes. Anything else? A quick question, Bante. Sure. Um, where in the Dhammapada, when we read in the morning, there's a section where it says, in the essential, we see the unessential. Well. Can you explain that for me, please? What is essential? Keeping your precepts. Okay. What's unessential? Breaking the precepts. That answer it for you? Yes, thank okay. you. <laughs> Everything comes, of, comes about because of precepts. They're really, really important. And you might hear me and get tired of me talking about it so much, but it needs to be talked about. You need to be reminded 
that this is an essential part of living a happy life. And that's what everybody is after. Everybody wants to be happy. Bye.